you're listening to the Ikra Book Festival 2021, bringing you fresh and innovative content in literature and authorship. Brought to you by the Art and Radio Ramadan 365. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the second year of the Ikra Book Festival. Um, you're with me, Maria Sharif, and I'm delighted to invite the next interviewer, who is Sumbala Qureshi. Sumbala will be discussing calligraphy and Middle Eastern literature and historical reception in Scotland with Dr. Frederica Voigt, who has got a special interest in manuscripts from the Islamic world. She's uh, currently a curator at the National Museum of Scotland. And just a little bit about her interviewer, who is Sumbala Qureshi. She is a children's learning and behavioral specialist, and she's had over 25 years of experience. She's also a parenting consultant and a coach, and she has an interest in integrating Western psychology with Eastern philosophy. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest, Frederica Voigt. Uh, she's principal curator at National Museum Scotland, responsible for the collections from West, South and Southeast Asia. Much of her research centres around the museum's acquisition history and its relation to the collecting interests of Scots in the 18th and 19th centuries. She's a specialist in 19th century Iranian material culture and has published widely on the role of ceramic crafts in facilitating social change during the Qajar period. Currently, she's working on a book that explores the Iranian collection at National Museum Scotland with a focus on individual and collective ideas of home and how they are expressed in objects of art, fashion and material culture. Thank you for joining us today, Frederica. In your own time, if you could please start the presentation. Thank you for your introduction. I'm going to share my screen now. Good afternoon everyone and again thank you Simha for your kind introduction. Calligraphy and Middle Eastern culture is a large topic, too large and too significant to be covered in a single talk. I will therefore give you today a taster and show you a few examples of manuscripts and books as well as draw your attention to a selection of contemporary artists who use calligraphy in their works. I hope to spark your interest in this way and uh, that you will feel inspired to explore this fascinating topic further for yourself. I'm showing you here the first two pages of a work by the 12th century Iranian author Sanai. Its Arabic title is given in the gold painted fields at the top of each page. It translates into the Garden of Truth and the Law of the Void Path. This long didactical poem, or Masnavi, was a very influential work, as the number of copies that were made of it attest. This copy dates from 1282. The pages show repairs and some are missing, but it has survived for more than 700 years. Sanai was well known for writing religious poetry. He discussed ethical and spiritual questions and the meaning of human life. Sometimes he used tales to illustrate his discourse. Among them is the famous story of the elephant and the blind men of Gore, a story which he probably knew from Buddhist sources. It goes as follows. A group of blind men who have never experienced an elephant learn what this animal is by touching it. Each of them feels a different part of the elephant's body, its side, a task, a foot, or, a or the tail. However, not more than one part at a time. Afterwards, they describe to each other what they think an elephant looks like. However, their descriptions are very different. As others before him, Sanai used this story to illustrate that humans tend to describe the truth based on their limited experience and to ignore other people's experiences, which, though equally limited, might be equally true. 
This manuscript is kept in the John Wylands Library in Manchester. It was part of more than 3,000 Oriental manuscripts and books bought by the Scottish collectors Alexander William Lindsay, the Earl of Crawford and Balcaris, and his son, for their family library, the Bibliotheca Lindesiana, one of the largest private libraries in Britain in the 19th century. Alexander Lindsay's vision was to bring together a comprehensive library that would give an account of knowledge in all cultivated languages, Oriental as well as European. Another manuscript I want to show you is this copy of Abu Rehana Biruni's Chronology of Ancient Nations and Their History, which is kept in the library of the University of Edinburgh. If you look closely, you will see the name R.M. Binning written in the oval field at the top of the title page and underneath the note Isfahan, July the 4th, 1851. Robert Blair Munro Binning was an administrator in the service of the East India Company in Madras, which is today Chennai. An, an, an enthusiastic linguist acquainted with Arabic, Persian and Hindi, he collected manuscripts in these languages for his own studies. On leave from his post on health grounds, he traveled through Ceylon, that's Sri Lanka today, and Iran in 1850 and 1851. He visited the tombs of the poets Hafiz and Saadi in Shiraz before moving on to Isfahan, where he bought this copy. Binning donated his collection of 140 Oriental manuscripts to the Free Church of Scotland's New College and the University of Edinburgh's library in 1877. Abu Huini became famous as an author in the West through the translation of his chronology by Eduard Sachau in 1878. Sachau brought together several copies of Biruni's work to compare them for his translation. Two of them were probably made on the basis of the manuscript that is now in Edinburgh. The chronology was al Biruni's first major work written around the year 1000 when he was 27 years old. A scholar with an immense knowledge in the 21 chapters of the chronology he discussed astronomical, historical and religious questions. The collecting of Oriental manuscripts served mostly scholarly studies. Only with their translations into European languages did the authors of these works become more widely known in the West. However, this did not yet include poetry, a gap which Louisa Stuart Costello sought to address with her book, The Rose Garden of Persia, published in 1845. Costello brings a wide range of authors to the attention of the English speaking world that included Fredusi, Atar, Saadi, Ansari, Rumi, or Hafez, just to uh, mention a few. An enriched version published in 1899 was printed by TNA TNA Constable in Edinburgh. It included an essay by Joseph Jacobs, in which he laments the fact that only Omar Khayyam and Hafez seemed to have become household names in Britain. One publisher and printing house that certainly contributed to and benefited from this situation was T.N. Fowlis in Edinburgh. Thomas Noble Fowlis established his own printing business in 1903 at at 3 Frederick Street in Edinburgh. He embarked on an energetic and varied publishing program, becoming well known for exquisitely designed and printed yet affordable books. As Ian Elphick and Paul Harris write in their excellent history of T. N. Fowlis, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam was a book that appears and reappears in different series, different formats, and with different illustrators throughout the firm's life. The Rubaiyat were joined by several 
um, editions of Hafiz, while Jami is was published only once in 1905. Luisa Stuart Costello was part of Fowler's program, as was a man called J.K.M. Shirazi. Also, I'm not clear who Shirazi was. I would like to assume for the time being that with him, Fowler's gave voice to a contemporary writer of Iranian background and of his opinion on, on the famous subject of Khayyam. Shirazi's biography of Khayyam was published by Fowlers in 1905. It was bound in decorated paper with a pattern in Persian floral style. There was also a limited edition of Shirazi's biography, uh, 250 copies that were bound in hand illuminated paper that had been imported from Iran. Shirazi's biography is interesting from several points. Also, he is grateful to Western authors for popularizing Khayyam. He wants to present Khayyam's life from a Persian point of view and to give an account of his philosophy as it was un understood by his admirers in Iran. He used sources in libraries that were not accessible to non-Muslims and concludes that his results differ considerably in important respects from the opinions commonly accepted by Western students of Khayyam. Let me now take you on a slightly different journey and widen the picture to include artistic responses to the cultural significance of language, poetry and calligraphy here with a focus on Iran. I will introduce four artists who work in different materials from printmaking to sculpture and painting to fashion design, demonstrating the relevance and deep connection of the world of the word and its manifestation in poetry and writing with all spheres of life. The selected artworks are all in the collection of National Museums Scotland. The first one is Gila Peacock and her screen printed book, Ten Poems of Hafez. Sheila Peacock was based in Glasgow when she started thinking about her Hafez project in 2001. Growing up in Iran, Farsi had been her first written language. She went back to it after 40 years of studying and living in the UK returning to some extent to her roots. Reading Hafez, she remembered the symbolic imagery in his poetry, which she turned in this book into calligraphic shape poems, a technique which she remembered from her childhood and which looks like this. Calligraphic uh, poems are written so that their outlines render a particular object. Gila Peacock selected poems in which Hafiz uh, refers to a particular animal and uses it as a mystical metaphor. The whole book includes 10 of these poems, poems, so that means 10 different animals, and in addition to the ones that I'm showing you here, she also uh, represented the butterfly, deer, lion, the falcon, and the nightingale. Shape poems can be very difficult to read as the words do not always follow the sequence in the poem. The book therefore includes the original verses as well as her translations. This was a further step for her to engage with the Iranian side of her heritage, and it was not an easy one as the attempt, uh, attempt to translate requires interpretation. And certainly it wasn't, it was uh, challenging with Hafez, since English is not able to capture the double meanings of some of the words that he uses. The calligraphic poems 
were screen printed. So what you see here is not the original writing, but because she wanted to produce several copies, so she chose to print these. To give you a little taster uh, of the intricacy of her writing, I have enlarged here two sections that form the beak and the tail of the night nightingale. The beginning of the poem in which the nightingale features forms the beak. It says, Raftam Babar, I went to the garden. However, the second part of the first stanza, which she translated, as the cry of the nightingale, Bulbuli de Bulbuli, forms the tail of the bird. The second artwork is by Parvis Tanavuli. It's uh, this sculpture is entitled Standing Heat. And with the sculpture, Tanavuli translates calligraphy in a three-dimensional form. The word heat means nothing in per Persian, and there are different layers of meaning to the word nothing that he uses in this sculpture, and, but maybe there are as many as con a contemplations of it, um, contemplation of the sculpture can give us. One of Tanawuli's explanation for his idea to create his first huge sculpture back in the 1960s was an allusion to the need to empty his thoughts in the way of Sufis. He wanted to become clear about what he wanted to do next as an artist, but he felt that he didn't have the necessary space for thinking about it. In his sculpture, he clearly plays with the inconsistency of the word stating that there is nothing. However, we see in front of us a physical um, object, so the sculpture. We could understand this also as a reference to the layers of meaning that the lines of Persian poetry can entail. The three letters of the word are written in the calligraphic style of Nastali. The first letter is above the horizontal line where the last one would just go underneath and sits here on this uh, cube. In addition, Tanawuli gave the sculpture movement by twisting it slightly and in this way emphasizing its three-dimensional nature. So it's something that wouldn't be possible while writing on paper. Tanavoli's inspiration came from popular culture. He was one of the founders of the so-called Sakharana movement. And these artists reinterpreted visual traditions of Iranian culture in the context of modernism. Like Tanavoli, Tehran-based artist Khosran Khosrow Hassan Zadeh is inspired by popular themes. In his series, Ya Ali Madad, O Ali Help, he used 19th century photographs of representatives of different social classes in Qatar, Iran, to express his concerns about the loss of values and care for each other in society today. The central figures are two Pahlavan uh, or wrestlers, Regarded as heroes, they were expected to follow high moral standards and to use their strengths and influence in society to protect those who were in need. Imam Ali, protector of the poor, is regarded as their patron. During their physical exercises in the Surkhana, or the House of Strengths, as it is translated, the Pahlavan would chant, Yo Ali, O Ali. The word Ali written in orange on the blue and the yellow backgrounds fill, fills most of the space around the figures, as if it was spoken, filling the air. Whirling in different directions, the words express, express the words express the movement that the Pahlavans carry out during their exercises. And finally. Uh, this silk jacket by 
uh, the label Sawir. In this jacket, Rana Mudabar and Rafael Turki Sharaf, Sharif Abadi use quotes from poetry as part of the design. One of them comes from the Ghazals of the 14th century Shirazi poet Hafiz. As the Doya Sohan Ishq Nadidam Khushtar. I have not found a sound more beautiful than that of the word love. The designers were drawing, in their own words, on one of the richest arts in Iranian culture, literature, and specifically poetry. They wished to illustrate this importance in a sophisticated design for a woman's garment. They printed, therefore, the quotes in gold to emphasize the values which they express. This quote from Hafez Ghazals is very popular in Iran and used in interior decoration written on walls carved uh, in wood for decorative items and, or printed on max. Another quote used on this jacket comes from the Shahnameh, or Book of Kings by Abul Qasim Ferdowsi, written between 977 and 1010 for Sultan Mahmud of Ghazna. It reads, Khert Cheshme Jonast Tun Benegir. Wisdom is the eye of the soul, therefore look. I would like to end in the words of the designers who interpreted this verse as follows. As you cannot be happy without seeing the beauties of the world with your eyes, you cannot find happiness in your life without wisdom. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Frederica, for your fantastic presentation. It was really very informative. Uh, it was a delight, actually, a visual delight to watch. Um, I have prepared a few questions here. Um, a few of them are personal questions, and I'm sure we'll take a few questions from the audience as well. So the first question is, how did you come to find an interest and a passion for calligraphy and Middle Eastern literature? Thank you. Well, it was during my undergrad studies that I was exposed to Iran as a, a possible area of specialism, and I fell in love with the language and the culture when I visited the country for the first time in 1993. I have returned to Iran to visit, but also um, to do more research, so field uh, research. And when I worked for the Museum of Islamic Art and the Museum of Ethnology in Berlin, I discovered a series of wall tiles painted with Tehran street scenes in their collections. And I started to go deeper into the question of their relevance in the 19th century. And that was really then what got me started in the museum world, but particularly also with focus on Iran. And since uh, moving to Scotland, I have collaborated, I have been collaborating with the Edinburgh Iranian festival on a, a range of inspiring projects. It included a dance performance with, um, uh, with Scottish Iranian musician and filmmaker Roxana Wilk, uh, but also a fashion show in the museum um, in, in the Grand Gallery where I bought the, for the museum the silk coat I showed you. And currently I'm working on an exhibition on our Iran collection for 2022. So that keeps me busy and also happy because I will be able to show again our contemporary art, Iranian art, but also draw on our historical collections. That's great. Um, my second question is the painting that we saw, Ya Ali Madat one, um, if you could tell a little bit more about how you acquired uh, that painting and a little bit about the history behind it. Yeah, in th that was indeed uh, my very first acquisition that I did as a curator. Um, 
And my first acquisition for this museum here, it was quite a challenging start because uh, to that point, I had no clue how actually to decide on an object or on something to acquire, what makes a good artwork, um, how it would fit into the gallery for which it was um, this, uh, uh, decided to go into it. And I can't really remember how I found out about the gallery in Berlin who had an exhibition on Khosra Hassan Sadeh, who is the painter of this, this painting. However, because I was still going forwards and backwards between Scotland and Germany, I decided that I would go to Berlin to see all of his uh, works in the gallery which is always a good thing, of course, to see um, objects in, in the flesh. Yeah. But it was also interesting because I was just walking from one painting to the next. They were all somehow interesting, but none of them really convinced me that it, it was what, what I was uh, looking for. It was only... I mean, the moment of re re revelation was really when I spotted the smallest of all these paintings, which was hung up above um, an office cubicle. So it looked a little bit out of place um, and far away, actually. So I was concerned that it had already be, been uh, reserved for somebody else. But uh, since I had suddenly decided that this was the painting I wanted, I didn't want to go to some somebody else. So I was very relieved when they said, yes, um, it was still available. And so uh, because I had fallen in love with this painting so much, I even went back uh, to see, oversee the transports and the packing. It was a freezing winter. And um, I checked the crate where it would travel then from Berlin to Scotland. Then later in spring, I also had an opportunity actually to meet with Khosra um, Hassan Sadeh in his um, studio in London, which is always a treat when you actually can talk to it's the artists in, in person. And he explained much more and of course more in his own words than any catalogue can do what what he had in mind why he was interested in this topic that he was focusing on in this series and he was also um, contemplating his writing experience um, and uh, at the end he he showed me how he used the brush in order to create the writing on on the paintings and he said that he is probably criticized by calligraphers because it wasn't following uh, the rules or the exact rules but then he gave me the brush and said okay so now you do it and I left my marks on his on the floor of his studio so it was <laughs> very, <laughs> very nice to to have had this moment yeah absolutely absolutely so my next question is how can the public partake of the exhibits and the artifacts and how can they find the re relevance in their lives? Yes, of course. I mean, this is an important um, or something that museums always hope. So we don't collect this uh, just because the curator likes it. It's always uh -huh. with the public in mind and to share something about a particular culture or an event. So these days it is very much um, sustainability and um, climate change. Uh, but with this topic, uh, I have asked to copy the links to the pages into the uh, chat so that um, interested people could follow up on the catalogues that are in the Manchester Library, but also uh, university libraries. So if you click on them, it will take you to, to the top um, page. And of course, this, this is a really good way, particularly for these fragile um, manuscripts that these days we can actually scan them, scan them and make them digitally available. So in the past, you would have had just... Um, 
um, the researchers sitting on their own in the library and um, studying them, but in this way, they can actually be accessed by many more people. And of course, the, the objects I showed you then that are in the NMS collection, some of them are uh, on display in the gallery Artistic Legacies and uh, others will be uh, on show in the forthcoming exhibition. Fantastic. Uh, talking of artifacts and manuscripts, what's the toughest one to preserve? Well, I'm not so much exposed to paperwork, but uh, textiles can be equally um, uh, vulnerable, particularly to moth when you think about felt or any other textiles. So that is a challenge for museums to keep them safe. Um, sometimes, so organic materials more than ceramics or metal work, um, which are the areas that I work very much with so uh, and anyway so we, as curators yes you should keep this in mind but it's um, a conservator conservators question much more than relevant for to to us so I know that particularly modern materials can actually pose quite big questions so if you think about plastic as we don't know how they um, respond to time and what what processes they go through. So it's an never ending um, concern, basically. Fantastic. Okay. And can, do we have time for another question? Um, um we are at our last minute. Um oh, no, no, we're last minute. We're just about near the end of, of this session. Um, Frederica, there's there's a question that that I was interested in um, asking um, after speaking to Sumla about your your conversations beforehand, and it was just the distinction between what's considered Persian and Iranian art, or is it a need to to distinguish between the two? What's what's your opinion about that? So I try to move away from the term Persian because it came up during um, previous centuries as a response to um, uh, people starting to research manuscripts particularly because it is derived more from the language than from the culture. So the official name is Iran. So hence, it, it, I think it is better to acknowledge this and to call uh, the country, but also um, other related <clears throat> aspects, Iran or Iranian. And um, one question from one of the other interviewers, which is, um, how does it feel to be the custodian of what's essentially a really rich and inspiring legacy of, ad or of artifacts? How does, that, how does that feel for you personally? Well, this is basically what gets me up every morning. So it's this curiosity to find out um, how these objects are related to us, to our history. How did they come here? What can they tell us? Um, and, and also to um, increase the collection, so to represent other cultures in, in the national Scottish collections to be able or that future generations will be able to continue this work and um, to include communities here so that um, we acknowledge with what we have in terms of material culture, this, uh, the life that we live together. Thank you so much, Frederica, for that insight into um, your work at the National Museum and also to Sumla for interviewing. Um, thank you so much to both of you. We're delighted that you could um, participate. Time. Pardon, Sumbla? Thank you, Frederica, for taking the time to speak with us. And thank you, Maria, for um, the introduction as well. For more podcasts, search for RR365 wherever you get your podcasts.